Is there then, to our next question, is there anything about mitigating risk, uh, mitigating this risk if we do find out where the data is? Is there any special secret sauce to do that? You know, I think with social engineering tax, um, which is primarily what we're seeing, is uh, the single biggest thing we've done is to do multi-factor authentication. Um, uh, you know, it is stealing those credentials, and, uh, and but then not providing that level of access to, uh, to anybody who has those credentials. Um, we're also a single sign-on shop, so, um, you know, in one way, uh, before multi-factor, if somebody got a hold of those keys, um, they have access to a whole lot of things. I think luckily we've seen that you know most of the social engineering attacks have been financially focused, so they're looking at looking at doing very specific things rather than you know exploiting or exfiltrating a huge amount of data. Um, but multi-factor has been a huge improvement in that because it essentially blocks uh, one of those attack vectors. Yeah, anytime you you uh, you know back up on layers so that you, any one piece of the puzzle doesn't give you the keys to everything. Right. And multi-factor is, is definitely a big part of that. And I, you know, as we're about to talk about with ransomware, backing up your data is it's protection against you know the possibility of malware attacks, but it's also the possibility of you know f physical problems like hard disk goes down or uh, you know any number of different sorts of, of emergencies that that would occur. It's kind of uh, uh, mitigating not just security as a, a silo. It's it's spreading it over you know, physical and uh, security, among other things. And one, one other thing, I think this, this plays across some of the questions we're going to be um, discussing, but, um, and it's not essentially a way of mitigating, but I think it's a way of addressing some of these issues, um, is having clear policies about what um, the university or the IT department or security department uh, can and will do when uh, you know, a vulnerability or a compromise is discovered. Um, I think that, uh, you know, that balance between convenience and security, um, getting to the point where, first of all, you come to some agreement about what that balance should be, but also that it's clear how you will enforce those policies. Um, I think that uh, there's this assumption that, you know, I, uh, we don't want to inconvenience you by re-imaging your computer when we think that there's a, uh, that it's been compromised or you're changing your account or something like that. And I think kind of we have to get beyond that. I mean, there's, there's obviously a balance, but getting to the point where it's understood that if I discover this on your machine, my course of action is to re refresh your machine, uh, and it's just expected. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, the the, uh, the Joker line in Dark Knight where he's talking about, if you describe what's going to happen, no matter how horrible it is going to be, people feel much more okay with it. So if you have an acceptable use policy that's there, laid out, you know what's going to happen, then, you know, they, they're not as, you know, traumatized by what's about to happen. And, uh, oh, lost the other thought, um, something about, um, oh, uh, having uh, snapshots or something where they can uh, uh, re-image very quickly mm -hmm. so it's not as much of a trauma. Right. Uh, and roll back. One of the, um, I, I look at uh, some of the mitigation strategies that I've seen successful in, in larger networks. Uh, there's, there's a couple. Uh, for some of the social media attacks and the things that are happening, which is, here, here's the thing. Every network is, is either being attacked, currently infiltrated, how many times and how deep, that's really the question. And so um, I look at it as um, really, truly, if humanly possible, create a, uh, a strategy book, if you will, of, of what you're gonna do about these threats, to your point. Mm -hmm. And then within that book, um, what, what are those mitigation strategies? The top three I'm seeing right now, social media attacks that are coming via email links. And the best mitigation strategy that, that I'm seeing people do for that is um, email filtering with sandbox mode. Mm -hmm. And that sandbox mode is the key because all of these things are new. They're brand new threats. They're all just zero day stuff. So um, that's the first thing. The other is, I know universities don't wanna hear this, but you should be doing web filtering, period. Yes, don't, you don't care where they go per se, but there are sites that are embedded with all sorts of bad things. So scanning that on the perimeter helps to defend against that unknowing click that they, that they either accidentally do or they get through Facebook or something and that actually has some malicious content. And then the third, of course, is the backup or the restore back or, or an act solution, take them off the network if there is something that senses that they're breached. So all of those things can help. And web filtering, I mean, there's different ways of doing web filtering. Of course, there's the, you know, the, the one that most people think of that is the, you know, 
don't go to porn sites or what you know that's not necessarily how you want to do it i mean there's there's other indicators that can tell you more about whether something is potentially malicious like uh the f the way that the url is formatted if it's particularly random or it bounces right well or, or time to life like mm -hmm. uh, how long has the site been a around if the site is brand new okay, maybe you should, you know, stick that somewhere and double check that they really meant to go to that or rather than, you know, something like an established news site that's going to be around for long enough that, you know, that is in itself a, a measure of trust. Yeah, I was going to kind of give a shout out to um, the Ren Isaac. Um, it's a group I belong to, but I think it's, it's really valuable. And they have um, a service that, uh, a couple different services, but one is essentially providing you uh, a constantly updated list of you know, malicious sites or IPs. Um, the other one is that they're doing something where they're looking at um, brand new um, uh, domains. And so the idea being that um, it's very unlikely that you have a need to go to a domain that's only been up for an hour and a half, right? right? And so you might block that until some later period, and I think that maybe addresses what you were just saying. Yeah. Reputational um, filtering, that sort of thing. Like if there's enough people that have gone to it and determined that it's, it's innocent as opposed to something that's brand new and potentially malicious. I think the other thing, um, we've had kind of an interesting case where uh, on the same campus that we teach uh, mostly working adults, uh, we also have a charter program, and so we have K through 12. And so during the day when that K through 12 program is on, we have to follow um, regulations for um, what children can have access to on the internet. And so on a timed basis, we turn on controls, web filtering, uh, and then turn them off when those classes are over. And what's interesting is to be able to look at the before and after and say, you know, what over a long period of time, what kind of traffic or malicious activity have we seen while those controls were in place versus turning them off? And sometimes that's a good argument for, you know, uh, let's turn off a few more things. And you can kind of ease into doing some filtering. Well, there, there are great mousetraps out there. Some are better than others. Um, you know, again, with Borderland, the firm that I represent, we find uh, we represent uh, a few different solutions that are for that are specifically for security versus control over porn and things like that that we don't want to uh, have adults um, removed from. However, many of those are infected, and so it often we can uh, there are web filters that can strip out some of the malicious content by still allowing other things, and and that brings to the the biggest problem right now with with. Um, web filtering and all these other type of network security, as someone interfaces with the general world, uh, those things are becoming more and more secure, encrypted communications and things like that. Case in point, Google, Yahoo, they're pushing everyone on the internet if you want to even be part of it to SSL encryption. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the problem with that is now it makes it a lot more difficult for devices in a network access points and others to see what you're doing and to be able to help you and secure you. So because of that, uh, there now have to be, if you're gonna do a web filter, if, and again, not for pornography reasons, but just for security reasons, because that's a part of, of network security, you have to be able to decrypt large amounts, 10 gigabit kind of amounts of traffic in a very big way. And when you do that, you have to have the right size firewall to do it. And so, so that's some of the things that I'm dealing with with a lot of our uh, customers is, is how to get the right size device in there, upgrade to the big 10 gig network, whatever they need or more. Uh, I think we, we have one that's going in that's like 50 some gigs, which is an amazing amount of traffic. But be able to SSL decrypt that traffic as it goes in. It's an amazing, amazing uh, future. Well, and I think the other side of that is kind of a shared governance um, mm -hmm. concern about privacy uh, of traffic. So, I mean, I don't think students potentially would um, have an issue or even be aware of, you know, that you're looking into that traffic. Um, but I know from faculty point of view, uh, there's real concern about the privacy of the information they're doing. And so, uh, you know, setting up policies, but also um, defining what your privacy policy is, is really important because there may be an assumption, uh, and some of it might be true, that you've got staff now who, in one way or another, might have access to things um, that, uh, I mean, things that they're supposed to be protecting against, but also things that are private, uh, uh, that should be private. This is the conundrum of our, of our time, yes. of our day, <laughs> is how do you accurately protect and mitigate this risk while um, not crossing the line, and especially in the high, higher education network, this becomes the problem. There are good tools.